G'day, this is Chris Savage from Our Real Ministries in Australia, welcoming you to this session of the Book of Zechariah. I pray that it will be of benefit to you and help you in your Christian growth. Thank you for coming along. We're in uh, Zechariah tonight. We're looking at chapter 7, verse 1 to chapter 8, verse 23. Now, last week we had the interpretation of the two olive trees of the fifth vision. There were the two anointed ones who stand by the Lord of the earth. Uh, the immediate context in Zechariah's vision was uh, Joshua and Zerubbabel, uh, Joshua the high priest, Zerubbabel the governor. Uh, the fulfillment is in the tribulation with the two witnesses. Two witnesses in the tribulation began as a day of small things. The immediate context is the temple in the days of Zerubbabel, which, is a, which was, a, it was a small thing. Um, it was small compared to the Solomonic temple, but later it became the glorious Herodian temple. The sixth vision, a God will punish the sinners and rule with a rod of iron. Now we saw there, we saw a flying scroll and that represents the judgment from God. The curse of the law over the whole land. Now God is going to judge the law, lawbreakers and they're going to come to destruction. So he's going to make it. This is the fifth vision, sixth vision. He's going to make an end of sinners and wicked ones. The seventh vision, God will, will remove national wickedness. This is, this is about Israel. The vision that we have here is an ephah, uh, which is the, the true standard of weight. But it is corrupted because we have a woman sitting in the, the basket. <clears throat> uh, it tells us that she represents wickedness. <coughs> so she is the false measure that controls the world economic affairs. We also saw in the vision that she's lifted up and she's taken to Shinar, which is Babylonia. And what we see here is that the false economic system will eventually in the future <coughs> be moved back to Babylon to Babylon, where it all began on the Nimrod. If you look at Revelation 18, in the tribulation, Babylon becomes the world political capital of the Antichrist and also becomes the economic capital of the world. So Babylon has to be rebuilt. The eighth vision we had uh, uh, before God will establish the Messianic kingdom, God will judge the Gentile nations which oppress Israel. Now, we saw four chariots, agents of God's providence towards the Gentile nations dealing with Israel. They come; These chariots come from between two mountains of brass. Brass is a symbol of judgment. That was Mount Moriah and the Mount of Olives. We had four horses. And what we see in the scriptures, especially in this vision, is that they're ministering spirits who stand before the Lord and they go forth to bring judgment. The eight visions, wrap them all up. Eight visions. First one, God was angry with the Gentile nation because they weren't moving forward to bring his plan to pass. Second vision, God shows mercy to Israel. Third vision, God is angry with the Gentiles because they went too far in, in their uh, judgment against Israel. Fourth vision, we have uh, God promises restoration of Jerusalem. In, in vision four to seven, what we had there was there was preparation for restoration uh, by restoring the confidence in both the priesthood and civil authority. That was uh, uh, Joshua and Zerubbabel. Removal of the sinner and sin. And then in the eighth vision, we have the cycle is all put in force by this eighth vision, which, which is, it, it, it's, uh, it brings about the whole thing in the tribulation, which then brings about the coming of the Messiah. The symbolic act that we, we saw at the end of last week uh, was the placing of crowns on the head of Joshua, the high priest. And the lesson for the distant future is that the branch, the Messiah, will sit and rule upon his throne and he shall be a priest as well. So he's going to be king and priest. Lesson for the immediate future, uh, um, Zechariah's day, the crown shall be for a memorial and it will be placed in the temple when it's finished and others will come and they will help to build the new temple. And they, the people will then know that when this happening, that Zechariah was 
actually a prophet from God because these things will come to be fulfilled, the short term, short term um, prophecies of Zechariah. So that was last week. Okay. This week, we're looking, this week, we're looking at the question of fasting. We've finished the visions now. We're moving into the, the second part of Zechariah's book, which comprises uh, chapters seven and eight. Uh, and this deals with this specific question of fasting. Uh, and this section is quite different uh, from what we saw in the, in the first six chapters because there's no visions here. This is, uh, this is uh, none of the visions we're going to see, no more visions. Um, we're going to find, later on, we'll find a, a, another different style with the burdens um, from a nine onwards. Now, chapter seven and eight uh, come about because of a specific question Bought, brought uh, to Zechariah by a particular delegation who, who've come to him. Um, so, question of fasting. The real issue concerning the fast, and we see this in chapter 7, verses 1 to 7 of the book of Zechariah. Came to pass in the fourth year of King Darius, word of Jehovah came unto Zechariah in the fourth day of the ninth month, even in Chislev, now they of Bethel had sent Shereza and Regamelech and their men to entreat the favor of Jehovah and to speak unto the priests of the house of Jehovah of hosts and to the prophets saying, should I weep in the fifth month, separating myself as I have done those, these so many years? And came the word of Jehovah of hosts unto me saying, speak unto all the people of the land and to the priests saying, when you fasted and mourned in the fifth and in the seventh month, even these 70 years, did you at all fast unto me, even to me? And when you eat and when you drink, do not you eat for yourselves and drink for yourselves? Should ye not hear the words which Jehovah cried by the former prophets when Jerusalem was inhabited and in prosperity and the cities thereof round about her in the south? and the lowland were inhabited. So these are the, the questions concerning the fast here. Now, as he deals with the question of fasting, what we're going to see is we, come, we first come to the real issue here in verses 1 to 7. In verse 1, we have the date of this section of Zechariah's writing. It's in the fourth year of King Darius. That would make it uh, 518 B.C., uh, Chislev is the month, is the ninth month of the Jewish, is the, is the name of the ninth Jewish month. Uh, it's around about December the 7th. Uh, Chislev is November, December. On the 4th of Chislev, the word of Jehovah comes to Zechariah. So based upon what he says, we know now what happens in chapters 7 to 8. It, it comes two years after after the eight visions. So we've, we've finished the eight visions. Two years later, this is what's happening. Two years after, this is two years after the resumption of the building of the temple, based upon the date that we have from Haggai uh, chapter 1, verse 12 to 15. Now, it's also two years before the completion of the temple. And we see that from Ezra chapter 6, verses 14 to 15. So this takes place around about the halfway point between when they resume the building the temple and when it's completed. It's just a halfway point. And in verse 2 to 3, he gives us the occasion for this section of Zechariah. In verse 2 to 3, the first part of verse 3, we have a, a delegation have come to Zechariah from Bethel. It says, they of Bethel. Now, the name Bethel is interest or Bethel here is interesting because uh, before the Babylonian captivity, uh, if you cast your mind back, Bethel was uh, was very famous for uh, for something special. It, well, it was one of the two cities which Jeroboam the first made the main center of idolatry in the northern kingdom. Remember, the northern kingdom separated from the southern kingdom, Judah. Uh, at the death of Solomon. And so Jeroboam I, he was the king of the northern kingdom, and he decided 
that he was going to keep uh, those tribes up there from going down to uh, going into Jerusalem to worship. So what he did was uh, he built um, some uh, some idols at Bethel. Uh, so that's this is the Bethel we're talking about here. So Bethel was formerly a Jewish center of idolatry. Now, as a result of that, it, that was the, one of the prime, well, it was a primary reason for the Babylonian captivity. Uh, and we see this from Amos chapter 3, verse 14, and Amos uh, chapter 4, verse 4, and Amos 5, 5 to 6. We also know that Bethel was rebuilt after the return from Babylonian captivity, because Ezra tells us that in Ezra 2.28, and Nehemiah tells us that in Nehemiah 7, verse 32. The one good thing is that they did not reestablish the golden calf worship in Bethel. The very fact, that we see here, the very fact that a delegation now comes down to Jerusalem from Bethel, it shows that the, the uh, inhabitants of Bethel have recognized that Jerusalem is the it, Jerusalem is the divine center for worship for Jewish worship by the people of Bethel. So they have, uh, they're not interested in idol worship anymore. In fact, the Babylonian captivity uh, uh, cured <laughs> the idol worship of, of the Jews. Never went back to it after that. Now Bethel sends two key men down. Uh, One's name Shereza, and the other is Regem Melek. And they had a few men with them. Yeah, those men would have been their escort. Now, these, both these names, they're not Jewish names. They're actually Babylonian names. And what this does, it shows us that they are Jews who had returned from Babylon, having been born in Babylon in that 70-year period. This is the reason why they have these Babylonian names. Their purpose in coming to Jerusalem was, first of all, it was to entreat the favor of Jehovah. They came to ask for God's grace. So obviously, uh, these men are, are part of the believing remnant. And second, they came to speak unto the priests. And that is to, to confer with the priests of the house of Jehovah of hosts and with the prophets. So in this case, it would have included Zechariah, definitely. Well, he's there. And since the word prophets is in the plural, probably Haggai as well. Now, the specific question that they raise is in the end of verse 3. And their question is, uh, should I weep in the fifth month, separating myself and, and separating myself? That's for mourning and fasting. That was their question. Should we continue to fast or should we continue to weep in the fifth month, which includes fasting and mourning? Should this fast continue? The fifth month in Hebrew is Av, uh, which is around about July, August, A.V., Specific day of the, of the month, which the men are referring to, is the ninth. The ninth of Av has become the second most important fast day in Judaism. It's the second most important. Yom Kippur, Day of Atonement, is the most important. But this is the second most important because it, it originated with the destruction of the city, Jerusalem, and the temple by the Babylonians. So when these men come from Bethel to ask if they should continue to fast in the fifth month, they're referring here to the day when Jerusalem and the temple were destroyed by the Babylonians. Should they continue fasting as they had done these so many years? From the year 586 BC, when the temple was destroyed, until the year 518 BC, which is where we are uh, in this instance now, when this inst it, it was 69 years. So the 70 years of Jeremiah 2511, uh, which is the 70 years of captivity, are just about completed. Therefore, in light of the fact that the 70 years of captivity were coming to an end, and in light of the fact that the temple was already in the process of being rebuilt, 
should the fast of the ninth of Av continue? And this is the fast that they've been observing for the past 69 years, 69 or 70 years. Should that continue? That's the question they're asking. But uh, just some, some background here. This is not the only thing that happened on the ninth of Av. In uh, rabbinic tradition, uh, the judgment of Kadesh Barnea, which we see numbers 13 to 14, which caused the Jewish nation to continue their wandering. Another 40 years also occurred on the 9th of Av, but uh, that's only rabbinic tradition. It, it doesn't say so in, in the scriptures, but we do know that other things happened on that day, which caused it to become the second most important fast day in the Jewish calendar. So not only was the, the Solomonic temple destroyed on this day, years later, it was also on the 9th of Av in AD 70, that the second temple, the Herodian temple, was destroyed. On this day, the, the, the city of Betar, uh, Betar was the headquarters of the second Jewish revolt against the Romans. That was also destroyed. It was also on this day that the Temple Mount was plowed over and it was sown with salt. Uh, this was also the day in, in, in modern history when the expulsion from Spain of the Jews in 1492 occurred. So the 9th of Av is, is a very significant fast day, a very significant day in the Jewish uh, life. Yeah, in, verses seven, in verses four to seven, we're given God's answer. In verse four of chapter seven, the word of Jehovah now comes to Zechariah. And in verses five to six, instead of answering their question with either a yes or a no, God now chooses to point to the, to the hypocrisy of those men who are raising the question. You know, he, he, he's saying, listen, in, in verse 5a, uh, those who are uh, addressed are not just the two representatives here from Bethel, because God says, he says, speak unto all the people of the land. So this is all the people of Israel. So all the common people, not just these two guys, or just the city of Bethel. And he says, speak to all the people of the land, the common people, and to the priests. The priests were the leaders. So God is saying, speak to everybody. This is my answer to everybody here. Now, God points out that when they fasted, it was not for his sake. So he says, when you fasted and mourned in the fifth and in the seventh month, the fast, fast of the fifth month was the, fast, was the fast of the ninth of Av, which is the one we just spoke about. And the seventh month is the month called Tishri, and that was the fast of Gedaliah. Get a liar. That's when uh, who, who's get a liar? Get a liar was the governor of Jerusalem appointed by the Babylonians. Now, um, he was assassinated by some Jews who didn't like the fact that you know he was working for the Babylonians, and we see that in Jeremiah chapter 4, verse 12. So, God asks them, He says, Listen, when you fasted on these two occasions, the ninth of Av and also the the, the, the one for Gedaliah, uh, he says, when you fasted for these two guys, right? Uh, even these 70 years, for these past 70 years, did you at all fast unto me, even to me? And, and this is written very emphatically. It's a rhetorical question here. Did you really do this for me? And this rhetorical question requires a negative answer. Uh, well, no, we really didn't do it for you. They didn't do it for God. Although had, they had fasted for all those years, these 70 years, to commemorate the destruction of the Solomonic Temple and the assassination of Gedaliah, they had not really done it as unto the Lord. Also, he points out in verse 6 that when they were feasting and keeping the Jewish festivals, they were not doing that for the sake of the Lord either. The issue as God saw it was, 
Did you not eat and drink for yourselves? So again, rhetorical questions requiring positive answers. Yes, yes, they really did eat and drink just for their own sakes. It was not done for God. They were not doing any of these fasts for the glory of God. And in verse 7, he gets to the heart of the issue by pointing out their failure to obey the former prophets. And God says to them, should you not hear the words which Jehovah cried by the former prophets? So the former prophets, these were the ones who were pre-exile, pre-Jerusalem uh, 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 being taken away into captivity, Judah, captivity. These were the prophets who spoke to them before the Babylonian captivity came upon them. In those days, God says, Jerusalem was inhabited and in prosperity. Things were good. And the cities of Jerusalem were around about her. In other words, at that time, those cities were all around Jerusalem were still standing. And the south, that's the Negev, and the lowland, that's the, the Shapela, Shapela, were inhabited. The point of verse 7 is this. Obedience to the former prophets who God sent to them would have prevented this whole question of fasting ever becoming a national activity. And this is the point that Isaiah makes in Isaiah 58, verses 3 to 7. In other words, what he's saying here is that these fasts in the fifth and the seventh month were never commanded by God. They were instituted upon the people's own initiative because Jerusalem was destroyed and because Gedaliah was assassinated. But why was Jerusalem destroyed? Jerusalem was destroyed because of their obedience. So had they obeyed God's commands through the, the, the pre-exile prophets, Jerusalem would not have been destroyed. Jerusalem was destroyed only because they disobeyed God's prophets. The question of fasting would never have come up otherwise, had they obeyed. So at this point, as we can see here, God has not really answered their question yet. Instead, he points to their hypocrisy in this matter and to the issue which caused it to begin with. Now, now we come to the section which now deals with their disobedience to the prophets. And we see this in chapter 7 verses 8 to 14. Word of Jehovah came unto Zechariah, saying, Thus hath Jehovah of hosts spoken, saying, Execute true judgment and show kindness and compassion every man to his brother, and oppress not the widow nor the fatherless, the sojourner nor the poor. Let none of you devise evil against his brother in your heart. But they refused to hearken and pulled away the shoulder and stopped their ears that they might not hear. Verse 12. Yea, they made their hearts as an adamant stone, lest they should hear the law and the words which Jehovah of hosts had sent by his spirit by the former prophets. Therefore there came great wrath from Jehovah of hosts. And it is, to, and it is, it is come to pass that as he cried and they would not hear, so they shall cry and I will not hear, said Jehovah of hosts. But I will scatter them with a whirlwind among all the nations which they have not known. Thus the land was desolate after them, so that no man passed through nor returned, for they laid the pleasant land desolate. So in these verses, verses 18, 8 to 14, sorry, Zechariah now deals with the disobedience to the former prophets. In verse 8, the word of God comes to Zechariah, and in verse 9 to 10, he summarizes what the former prophets had to say. Thus has Jehovah of hosts spoken. Former prophets had basically told Israel that they had to do some very specific things. First of all, it says that they were to execute true judgment. Second, they were to show kindness and compassion every man to his brother. Third, they were to oppress not four classes of people, the widow, the fatherless, the sojourner, 
and the poor. The first two classes, the widows and the fatherless, are those who become the means of exercising true religion, according to James chapter 1, verses 26 to 27. And the fourth thing we see in this passage is the word to them was, let none of you devise evil against his brother in your heart. And these four points, Zechariah summarizes the words of the former prophets. And his main point is this. Why are you concerning yourselves with that which was not commanded when there's plenty to be concerned about which was commanded? Why be so concerned about these fasts which God had not commanded and yet you ignore what he did say through the prophets? So that's God's point here. And what we see here, because this became a tradition, the nature of tradition is it's concerned with those things that which God had not commanded. And that was the fast here. And they ignored uh, that which God did command through his prophets. And that's how they built up this tradition. Now, in verses 11 to 12, we see the process of apostasy here. Israel's disobedience is highlighted in verse 11 to 12. And we're given a stage-by-stage -stage process of how the apostasy took place. First of all, it says that they refused to hearken, refused to hear. Second, they pulled away their shoulder. So this was a, a, a visible act of rebellion against God. Third, they stopped their ears that they might not hear what the prophets were saying. Fourth, they made their hearts as an adamant stone, lest they should hear the law and the words which Jehovah of hosts had sent by his spirit by the prophets. So here we learn a very important truth concerning the origin of the prophetic word. What God spoke through the prophets was inspired by the Holy Spirit so that they had a prophetic voice. They were inspired by the Holy Spirit to speak. However, uh, there were these four steps to their apostasy. Therefore, there came great wrath from Jehovah of hosts. Their rejection of the prophets, who had spoken by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, resulted in them being rejected by God, which brought on their captivity. And we see this also in, in 2 Chronicles 36, 40 to 16, and Jeremiah chapter 8, verses 18 to 22. And so for this reason, in verses 13 to 14, we now see the judgment coming. In verse 13, he warns, uh, Jeremiah, uh, Zechariah warns that God will no longer listen to them. Israel made, made the first move. It came to pass as he cried, they would not hear. Now God responds, is, so they shall cry and I'll not hear. Uh, and it's true that once a point of no return is reached, this is what happens. Verse 14, the result of this was their dispersion. I'll scatter them with a whirlwind among all the nations which they have not known. Uh, and this is actually looking towards what is yet future to Zechariah's day. The whirlwind represents the Gentile nations who will scatter them. Uh, and we see, we see that from Daniel chapter 7, verses 1 to 3. Furthermore, God says that their land will lie desolate. So the land was desolate after them, so that no man passed through nor returned, for they laid the pleasant land waste. And the fulfillment is basically this. There was a partial fulfillment in the Babylonian captivity when the land did lay desolate for so long, 70 years. Remember, it was, to, it was also to give the land their Sabbath rest. As for the scattering part of this verse, its ultimate fulfillment took place in AD 70. The desolation of the land was a result of the destruction of the first temple, and the dispersion came as a result of the destruction of the second temple, the Herodian temple. Now we have a future restoration and prosperity of Jerusalem in chapter 8, verses 1 to 8. And the word of Jehovah of hosts came to me saying, 
Thus says to Hover of hosts, I am jealous for Zion with great jealousy, and I am jealous for her with great wrath. Thus says Jehovah, I am returned unto Zion and will dwell in the midst of Jerusalem, and Jerusalem shall be called the city of truth, and the mountain of Jehovah of hosts, the holy mountain. Thus says Jehovah of hosts, there shall yet all, there shall yet old men and old women dwell in the streets of Jerusalem, every man with his staff in his hand for very age. And the streets, this is verse five, and the streets of the city shall be full of boys and girls playing in the streets thereof. Thus says Jehovah of hosts, if it be marvelous in the eyes of the remnant of this people in those days, should it also be marvelous in mine eyes, says Jehovah of hosts. Thus says Jehovah of hosts, behold, I will save my people from the east country and from the west country, and I'll bring them and they shall dwell in the midst of Jerusalem and they shall be my people. And I will be their God in truth and in righteousness. So in verse 1 of chapter 8, the word of Jehovah comes to the prophet Zechariah again. In verse 2, he spells out God's jealousy over Jerusalem. I'm jealous for Zion with a great jealousy. I'm jealous for her with great wrath. God is repeating here a commitment he made in the first vision back in chapter 1, verse 40. God's jealousy over Jerusalem is seen in the fact that it has been overrun 46 different times since AD 70. <clears throat> but in that time, no indigenous government has ever been set up until Israel became a state again in 1948. Imagine, 46 different times it was overrun. But nobody set a government up there until Israel was rebirthed in as a state in 1948. Now in verse 3 of chapter 8, we see the restoration of Jerusalem promised. I am returned unto Zion. So Zechariah promises here that God will return. And this is a reference to the second coming. It's a promise also made in Hosea chapter 5, verse 15, uh, chapter 6, verse 3. And we see it in Matthew, um, Matthew 23, 37 to 39. Second, God says, I will dwell in the midst of Jerusalem. God is going to dwell there when? When Messiah rules personally from Jerusalem. So God will dwell in Jerusalem at that time. He'll be in the midst of it. That will then bring about two results. Jerusalem is going to be called the city of truth, because the one who is the truth is going to rule from there. And this is a point also made by Isaiah chapter 1, verse 26, and Isaiah 60, verse 14. But also, the mountain of Jehovah of hosts will be called the holy mountain. And this is the millennial mountain of Jehovah's house. Uh, we see this uh, in Ezekiel chapters 40 to 48. Ezekiel's 40 to 48. Now in verses 4 to 5, Zechariah prophesies here that Jerusalem is going to be inhabited during the Messianic kingdom by both the very old and the very young. Verse 4 deals with the very old. There shall yet old men and old women dwell in the streets of Jerusalem, every man with his staff in his hand for very age. The Hebrew reads there for a multitude of days, very age. Remember that by the end of the messianic kingdom, the end of the messianic kingdom, when Jesus is ruling for a thousand years, there will be people who are living who will be over a thousand years old. For example, uh, Jewish people of, 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 you know, who, who would be going into, entering into the Messianic kingdom at, at age 20 or, or at age 40, uh, by the end of the tribulation, uh, will go into the kingdom and they will live for a, that thousand year duration. And so at the end of the kingdom, they'll be 1,020 years or 1,040 years old. 
So there will be very old men and women dwelling in the streets of millennial Jerusalem in that day. And verse 5 deals with the very young. Uh, the streets of the city will be full of boys and girls playing in the streets thereof. So they're the very young ones. In verse 6, he also talks about the blessings for the remnant. He starts out by saying, if it be marvelous in the eyes of the remnant of this people in those days. Which days? The days of the Messianic kingdom, the future days of the Messianic kingdom. He's saying if it's, if it's, if it's, uh, if it's uh, marvelous in their eyes, it also be marvelous in mine eyes, says Jehovah of hosts. So here is another rhetorical question. This time it's demanding a positive answer. Yes, it will be marvelous in God's eyes as well. So not only will it be something to marvel at, at to the Jews living in that time when God restores a nation, it will also be marvelous in God's own eyes. Hebrew word here for, uh, uh, for marvelous is pele, P-E-L-E. It's one of those Hebrew words that refers to something that only God is or only God can do. Marvelous. So what Zechariah is talking about here is something only God can do. In verses 7 to 8, he deals with the salvation and the restoration of the remnant. Verse 7 emphasizes the regathering. Behold, I will save my people from the east country and from the west country. And then verse 8 deals with their restoration. God says, I will bring them. So he's going to regather them and then they shall dwell in the midst of Jerusalem. And the city will be inhabited again. And they shall be my people and I will be their God. So again, this is a future time. And this emphasizes here the salvation of Israel because they'll be saved in truth and in righteousness. So in verses 1 to 8, Zechariah prophesies about things which were well beyond his time. And these things were concerning the future restoration and prosperity of Israel. And this now brings us to the message for Zechariah's generation, the Zechariah of his day. He now refers back to his own time and speaks to his contemporaries here. Thus says Jehovah of hosts, let your hands be strong. This is verse 9 to 17. Let your hands be strong. You that hear in these days, these words from the mouth of the prophets that were in the day that the foundation of the house of Jehovah of hosts was laid, even the temple, that it might be built. For before those days, there was no hire for man, nor any hire for beast. Neither was there any peace to him that went out or came in because of the adversary. For I set all men, every one against his neighbor. But now I'll not be unto the remnant of this people as in the former days, says Jehovah of hosts. For there shall be the seed of peace, the vine shall give its fruit, and the ground shall give its increase. The heavens shall give their due, and I will cause the remnant of this people to inherit all these things. It shall come to pass that as you were a curse among the nations, or house of Judah and house of Israel, so will I save you, and ye shall be a blessing. Fear not, but let your hands be strong. For thus says Jehovah of hosts, as I thought to do evil unto you when your fathers provoked, provoked me to wrath, says Jehovah of hosts, and I repented not. So again have I thought in these days to do good unto Jerusalem and to the house of Judah. Fear ye not. These are the things that you shall do. Speak ye every man the truth with his neighbor. Execute the judgment of truth and peace in your gates. And let none of you devise evil in your hearts against his neighbor. And love no false oath. For all these things are things that I hate, says Jehovah. So here the message to Zechariah's generation. We have a call to obedience. It starts with a call to obedience. Let your hands be strong. And this is an encouragement here. What are they doing? They're rebuilding the temple. So he says, let your hands be strong. Keep on building. You that hear in these days the words from the mouth of the prophets. In other words, what they're to do is they're to obey the present prophets. And in, in here, uh, this is in contrast to their failure to obey the previous prophets. And the prophets here are Zechariah and, and Haggai. And these are the prophets who were 
in the day that the foundations of the house of Jehovah was laid. And this was 15 years earlier. Remember, 15 year, years earlier, they had started it. Zechariah and Haggai were there. And then we had the problem with San Malat and Tobiah uh, coming in and they, they caused it to be stopped. So Zechariah and, and Haggai were already there. And even the temple, even the temple that it might be built. So again, what we see here is that this is an encouragement to get on with the job and finish this second temple. You know, in verse 10, he reminds them of the situation in the land before they had returned. What was it like while they were in, in, uh, in um, exile? For before those days, that's before the foundation of the temple was laid, there were various troubles in the land. And Zechariah, Zechariah mentions three of them here specifically. First, in the land, there was unemployment. There was no hire for man, no hire for beast. They're out of work. Secondly, there was an external enemy. Neither was there any peace to him that went out or came in because of the adversary. Then there was internal strife as well. For I set all men, everyone against his neighbor. There were all these things were happening because of their failure to complete the rebuilding of the temple. Now Haggai made the same point in Haggai chapter 1 verses 2 to 6. Now, in verse 11 to 13, Zechariah makes a promise to his own generation. In verse 11, he promises there's going to be a change in the way that God deals with them. But now I will not be unto the remnant of this people, that, that's that generation of Zechariah's day, as in the former days, says Jehovah. So as far as Zechariah's generation was concerned, God was not going to deal with them as he had with the previous generations. Instead, what we see in verse 12, he says there's a promise of peace and prosperity. There shall be the seed of peace. And this has to do with agricultural prosperity. So he says, the vine, the vine shall give its fruit and the ground shall give its increase. And the heavens shall give their due. And these things show us that God was giving them the seed of peace. Then he says, I will cause the remnant of this people to inherit all these things. So Zechariah's contemporaries are going to receive all the benefits of this increased productivity of the land. And then in verse 13, he points out that God is going to remove the curse. It shall come to pass that as you were a curse among the nations, O house of Judah and house of Israel, uh, and notice here that we see both houses, uh, Judah and Israel, both of them have returned from exile. So will I save you and you shall be a blessing because of all that is promised. He then gives them further encouragement. Fear not, but let your hands be strong. Why? For the purpose of rebuilding the temple. Verses 14 to 15. The prophet now draws a contrast between God's present plans and his former plans. His former plans we see in verse 14. For as I thought to do evil unto you. When your fathers provoked me to wrath and I repented not. So that's the, the, the previous, previous mom. So God's former plans were to bring judgment upon them. But in verse 15, his, his present plans are different. So again, have I thought in these days to do good unto Jerusalem and to the house of Judah. So fear ye not, fear ye not. And then he repeats some of the summary of the former prophets in verses 16 to 17. For this was what they had to obey. He says, these are the things that you shall do. And he mentions four things from the teaching of the former prophets. And some of this is the same as what he said earlier. Some is not. First of all, he says, speak every man the truth with his neighbor. Second, he says, execute the judgments of truth and peace in your gates. Uh, third, let none of you devise evil in his heart against his neighbor. Uh, fourth, love no false oath. Now, why, why must I pay particular attention to these things? Because he says, for all these things I hate, says Jehovah. 
So this is the message to Zechariah's generation. Again, if you notice, God has not yet answered the question regarding fasting. He answered, hasn't answered it yet. Uh, men of Bethel are probably still waiting for the answer. But now, as we come to the, this last uh, little section in verses 18 to 23, he does give them his final answer uh, concerning those fasts. The word of Jehovah of hosts came unto me, saying, Thus says Jehovah of hosts, the fast of the fourth month and the fast of the fifth, the fast of the seventh and the fast of the tenth shall be to the house of Judah joy and gladness and cheerful feasts. Therefore, love, truth, and peace. Peace. Thus says Jehovah of hosts, it shall yet come to pass that there shall come peoples and the inhabitants of many cities. Inhabitants of one city shall go to another, saying, Let us go speedily to entreat the favor of Jehovah and to seek Jehovah of hosts. I will go also. Yea, many peoples and strong nations shall come to seek Jehovah of hosts in Jerusalem and to entreat the favor of Jehovah. Thus says Jehovah of hosts, In those days it shall come to pass that ten men shall take hold of it, and of all the languages of the nations, they shall take hold of the skirt of him that is a Jew, saying, We'll go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. So in these, first, in these verses here, we come to God's final answer concerning the fast. In verse 18, the word of Jehovah comes again to Zechariah. Verse 19, he makes, uh, he makes the point that all these fasts will be turned into feasts. He mentions a total of four different fasts. Uh, and in fact, none of them corresponds to the most important on the day of, on the day of atonement. Fast of the fourth month commemorates the time when Jerusalem was taken. And this is we see in uh, 2 Kings 25, 3 to 7, Jeremiah 39, 2 to 9, and Jeremiah 52, 6 to 11. The fast of the fifth month looks back to the time when the city was destroyed. And we see that in uh, 2 Kings 25, 8 to 9, Jeremiah 52, 12 to 14. Then he mentions the fast of the seventh month. Uh, this was when they commemorated the killing of Gedaliah. Uh, the fast of the tenth month was when Jerusalem was actually first besieged. Uh, and we see that in, in um, Jeremiah uh, 39, 1 and Jeremiah 52, 4, 2 Kings 25, 1. What he says here is that all of these fasts, which they're currently observing, shall be transformed into three things. First, they shall be to the house of Judah joy. Fasting is a time of mourning, second, and gladness. Usually fasting symbolizes sadness. However, third thing he says, and cheerful feasts. So these are all the exact opposite of fasting. You're not fasting, you're feasting. <laughs> you're not sad, you're actually joy and, and cheerful. So these uh, these four major events in Judaism are virtually eliminated in this way. Again, God had not commanded these fasts. So basically, he's telling them that, they, uh, that, that, uh, that what they wish to do about them for now does not really matter to him. If you want to keep them, you can keep them. That's fine. If you don't want to keep them, that's also fine. His point here is that all of these fasts will someday be turned into feasting. And because of this, he says, therefore, love, truth, and peace. Now, having given them a final answer concerning the issue of fasting, that God doesn't care whether they fast on those days in the year or not, because they should understand that one day they'll all be turned into feasts anyway. In verses 20 to 22, Zechariah now looks forward again to the prophetic future. And he prophesies here that Jerusalem will, in the future, become the center of world attention. 20 to 21 describes a call from God. It shall yet come to pass that there shall come peoples and inhabitants of many cities. So the inhabitants, in verse 21, the inhabitants of one city shall go to the inhabitants of another, saying three things. First of all, hey, Let's go speedily to, the, to entreat the favor of Jehovah. They want to go quickly to seek God's grace. Second, 
to seek Jehovah of hosts. They'll want to find him personally. How? Because he'll be there in the person of the Messiah. Third, those who are being encouraged to go will be accompanied by the one encouraging him to do it. I will go also with you guys. And in verse 22, we have three results. It says, first, many peoples and strong nations. And these are the many Gentiles who are going to make special pilgrimages to Jerusalem. This is something Zechariah will come back to later in, in chapter 14. Second, they will come to seek Jehovah of hosts in Jerusalem. They'll come wanting to see the visible, glorious Messiah. And third, they want to come to entreat the favor of Jehovah, to seek for his grace. And we see a similar thing in, in Isaiah 20, in Isaiah chapter 2, verses 2 to 3. And Zechariah, we're going to see this in Zechariah 14, 16 to 17. Now, this section here now ends in verse 23, promising that not only will Jerusalem become the center of world attention, but the Jews themselves will become the focus of Gentile attention. So he says here, it shall come to pass in that day, in that day in the prophetic future in the Messianic kingdom. Ten men shall take hold out of all the, lang out of all the languages of the nations, of the skirt or, or the hem of the garment of him that is a Jew saying, we'll go with you. We want to go with you because we have heard that God is with you. That's what they're saying. The point here is this. The Gentiles will turn to God in the kingdom on the basis that he has brought about the national regeneration and restoration of Israel. The Jews will be the agency by which Gentile salvation will become a worldwide reality in the Messianic kingdom. And this now ends uh, this, uh, this second main division of the book, and this ends our study for the night. Okay, that's our contact details there. I, I hope we've all learned something from tonight.